I'm going to presume on you this morning to attend over the next 25 minutes or so to what is being said, not because I have some catchy illustration to begin with that's going to make you think, boy, I really ought to listen to what this guy's talking about, <laughs> but more so because this is really the second part of a two-part message, and I'm really picking up kind of where we left off last week. So if you were here last week, you've already got the benefit of a 30-minute introduction, and again, if you're visiting with us or you weren't here last week, I'm just going to ask you to presume upon your attention span for a few moments and trust that this is at least a humble attempt to exegete the Word of God, and we're here to hear from our Lord. So we've come through Pentecost. We did that last week in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. We saw the miracle of communication that God performed on that day perfectly and miraculously enabling his disciples to do exactly what Jesus had commanded them to do, which was to be his witnesses. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem, and he said that they would be clothed with power from on high. Before that even, he told them that he was leaving the earth, but that he would not leave them alone. He would send a helper, the Holy Spirit, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit roared out of heaven and filled a room full of believers, 120 in all. And as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, they spoke in languages other than their own, in the native languages of the multitude of visitors who'd come to Jerusalem to worship at that time, people from all regions of the known world. They spoke, and these devout worshipers heard of the mighty works of God. Again, this was the commission Jesus gave his disciples, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. The coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost then is a promise kept. And as our passage for this morning explains, it is also a prophecy fulfilled. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. In verse 14. So Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Acts, the epistle to the Romans. Those little songs come in handy sometimes, don't they? Acts chapter 2, verse 14. And if you're using the Bibles provided, you'll find that on page 1081. If you're visiting with us this morning and you do not have a copy of God's Word, you'll find a copy like this probably in the seat in front of you. Uh, Feel free to take that for your own. We would love for you to have a Bible. We think everyone ought to have one, and we'd be happy to gift that to you this morning. So we are in Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Now the people who had heard, the, the, the basic context here, right? The people who had heard the disciples speaking in their own languages, we find they were amazed and they were perplexed. They didn't know what to make of what was happening. And so they ask a question. They say, what does this mean? What, what is going on here? And some were dismissive of what they were seeing and what they were hearing and actually made an accusation that, that, that the disciples that were speaking in all these different languages were drunk. So the Apostle Peter then proceeds to address this accusation, and that's where our text begins, uh, Acts 2, 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We take a moment to have a word with the author of that passage. Our Father and our God, 
Yours is the voice that we long to hear. Yours are the words that bring life, truth, instruction, meaning to our lives. And Lord, we humble ourselves now before your word, asking that by the power of your spirit, you might help us to receive it as it was intended and that it would do the great work that you want it to do. Bless our time in your word for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Peter assures the people in Jerusalem that the disciples are not drunk, right? There's all these people that have spilled out into the streets, and they're speaking in all these different languages, and someone mockingly says they're all drunk, and Peter comes up with this, right? They're not drunk, with wine at least, they're not drunk because it's only 9 o'clock. <laughs> now, i got to tell you, I have always read that the wrong way. I have, I, Peter is not insinuating that if you come back at four, you'll find a different situation on the ground, okay? I don't, that, maybe that's just me, that's how I've read it. I'm thinking, Peter, you could do better than that. But anyway, what he's really saying here is, is, is he's pointing out how silly a conclusion has to be drawn by those who don't have the heart to believe what is happening, that 120 uh, pious and devout worshipers would all be intoxicated for one thing. That, that, can you imagine the volume that would take in, in real terms? Again, so see, this is such a stretch to say this. And, 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 and that they would be intoxicated at such an early hour to boot. It, it, that's basically what he's saying. This doesn't, you, your accusation makes no sense. Even those who were given to such behavior, even most who were given to drunkenness, would not in large numbers be found in such a condition in the city at that time, okay? So that is what Peter is saying. This is ludicrous what you're saying. Now, I want you to notice that the accusation of drunkenness is made in mockery, because that's what the Bible tells us. Some were mocking, they were jeering, they were mocking what they were seeing. So G. Campbell Morgan in his book, The Birth of the Church, wrote this, It is a temptation when people are puzzled and cannot understand a thing to mock at it. If a thing amazes you, it's not wrong to be amazed. If a thing perplexes you, it's not wrong to be perplexed. If you want to know about it, it is not wrong to ask questions. But you're always sure to be wrong when you laugh at the thing you do not understand. And so it is with Christianity, don't you find it, out there, that many mock what they do not know and what they have not truly taken time to understand. Peter dismisses the odd accusation of drunkenness for what it is, and then he goes on to answer the question, what does this mean? What everyone was seeing and hearing on that day, he says, was the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. And just as he did in the choosing of Matthias, you might recall, Peter takes his audience right to Scripture. No one here is under the influence of alcohol, he says. This that you observe was predicted by the prophet Joel. And then he goes on to quote from the Old Testament book of Joel in chapter 2. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now maybe it's been a while since you've walked yourself through the Old Testament book of Joel. Um, so let me summarize it for you. It's really a, a, a book about God's judgment, and it's a small book. It's only three chapters long. And in it, Joel describes Israel's rebellion, Judah's rebellion against God, and the calamity that has come on the nation because of it. Locusts have eaten everything. That's, that's what you find when you turn to Joel. The locusts have eaten everything up. The crops have failed. The streams are dry. And the people and the land are literally and spiritually uh, destitute, parched. It is bad. It's really bad. And it's about to get worse when Joel calls everyone to repent. And he tells them to cry out to God. And not in some superficial way. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Right? We read that. We don't need the actions of repentance. We need the heart of repentance. And so he tells the people that they should repent and cry out to God, which they do, and they turn to the Lord with fasting and with repentance. And God has pity on them, and he relents, and he promises to restore them. 
He promises that he will abundantly restore their material needs, uh, sustenance and wealth, the crops, the wine, the oil, and so on. But the greater good of the restoration that was to take place that God promised was not about material prosperity, but the restoration of their relationship to God. That God, who was not with them for a time, would once again be with them. In Joel 2, verse 27, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God. That's the good news for God's people in that moment. But there was even better news that Joel wanted to talk about. Better news for God's people in the future. And this is the passage that Peter alludes to, Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. So the answer to the question posed in Acts 12, 12 by those who were wondering how to understand what they were seeing and what they were hearing, the answer to the question, what does this mean, is that God is delivering on his word from ages past. Because he keeps his promises. Because he's a trustworthy God. What's happening in Acts 2 is what Joel said would happen in Joel 2. This that you see is what was predicted. The coming of the Holy Spirit is a promise kept and a prophecy fulfilled. Now we should look at this prophecy from Joel 2 as we find it in Acts 2, starting with verses 17 and 18. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Peter takes a little liberty here from Joel, and he adds a, a phrase where in Joel we would read, and afterwards Peter says, and in the last days it shall be. And what that says to us, what we see right away, is that Pentecost initiates the period known as the last days. You and I are living, you know this, right? We are living in the last leg of the human race. How much longer God will tarry, no one knows. Why does he tarry at all, you may wonder? Why didn't Jesus just race back from heaven after his ascension to establish his eternal kingdom? Well, the Apostle Peter gives us some insight into that. 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, catch this, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, God is keeping this window open for a time so that you might come through it and find repentance and eternal life. Why is he slow? Because he loves people. He loves you. He's not willing that any should perish, but everyone should come to repentance, that you should have this chance to call on the Lord. That is true, but Peter goes on to say, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So what some perceive to be the slowness of the Lord to return is, in truth, patience, time for people to repent, but Christ will come back. Jesus will come back. Acts 1.11 tells us that he will return in the same manner in which he ascended on the clouds. You and I are living in the last days. We are living in that period between the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the last days, Peter said, God will be with and empower his people through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is how it's going to be. This is why Jesus told his disciples who were upset to hear that he was going to be leaving them. He says, John chapter 16, verse 7, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. None of us ever wants to hear that when a dear one is getting ready to depart, do we? Some people say that, well, you'll be better off without me. And we always say, no, we won't. Because we don't feel that we will be. But Jesus is actually telling the truth. Okay? Imagine that. It's all he can do and it's all he ever does. I tell you the truth. 
It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. If Jesus goes, the Holy Spirit will come. He'll be poured out on all flesh, on all God's people, everywhere at all times. And once again, the good news of God is what? That he is with us. Do you understand that? Like from the beginning to the end of the Bible, the desire of God is to dwell with man. Did you catch that? <laughs> you can't miss that, right? And so in, 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 in Genesis, we have God walking with Adam and Eve and dwelling with them until sin, and they are ex- expelled from that beautiful relationship and, and on the outs with God till such a time as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God himself, is incarnate and comes into the world to what? Dwell with, his name is Emmanuel. What is that? God with us. So here again we see it. And then Jesus says, but I've got to go. But he's also made some promises along the way, hasn't he? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will not leave you alone. Well, how's this going to look? The disciples don't know. They're weak and they're weary and they're huddled up in Jerusalem when all of a sudden we get the answer. It's to your advantage that I go because the Holy Spirit will come. And he will be with you, and he will be in you. That's the good news. God with us. He will not forsake us. He will be with us. And not in an impersonal way, but in a very personal way, taking up residence inside of believers. So Jesus has gone up, the Holy Spirit has come down, and we are living in that final period of life on earth until Christ comes back. The age of the Holy Spirit has begun. And God said he would pour out his spirit. Pour out his spirit. I don't know about you, but sometimes I read the scripture a little too fast. And I maybe skip over some things that I probably ought to dwell on and think about. And one of the beauties, to be honest with you, one of the things I love about my job is everyone's, I get the convenience of that. (laughs) Right? Because you all want something on Sunday. (laughs) So I get to slow down a little bit and read over some of these things and, 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 and... Try to get a grasp on the language. And here we are, something we probably all maybe just would skip over, that God is going to pour out his spirit. But I think it's a meaningful image, okay? So remember, we got to go back to Joel or we'll miss it. But remember in the book of Joel, when this prophecy was made, judgment is on the people. And God's manifest presence is withdrawn from the people. So, So many times in Scripture, we see how when a people chooses to reject God, refuses to worship him, refuses to serve him, he gives them over to experience the natural consequences of their choices, right? The destruction of sin, the bankruptcy of sin. If you don't want a a life with the Lord, he'll let you find out what life is like without him, right? He is God and he loves you, but if you reject him, if you don't want a life with the Lord, he will let you find out what it's like to live life without him. That's what's described by Joel. That's what's happening. God is saying, have it your way. And as a a result, the vines are dried up and the oil has run out and the barley has perished and the trees are barren. And the land and everything is in, in it is, is parched, bone dry in every way. What do they need? Literally, they need water. Physically, they need it to rain from heaven. And spiritually, all oh, they need the Lord. They need him to rain on them so they can experience what Acts will call the times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. And what does God do when they turn to him from a dry and thirsty land? When they wait on him and when they put their trust on him, he has mercy on them. Because that is the nature of our God. He not only is a promise keeper, he is a merciful, gracious God. And if you will turn from your sin, he will receive you. He will forgive you. This is what's happening. Joel 2, 23. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication and has poured, has poured down for you abundant rain. Okay? He will cause to come down for you. That's what poured means, this early and latter rain. 
So on that dry and thirsty land, a merciful God pours abundant life-giving water, and he would later pour out something even better, his Holy Spirit. God refreshes the land with his rain, and he refreshes his people with himself. Amen? Amen. With himself. So if you are dry today, and if you are thirsty, draw near to God, and he will draw near to to you. Well, it's one thing to see a downpour coming, it's another to be caught in it, right? We've all had those experiences. Yeah, I think it's going to rain. <laughs> okay. Well, Joel had this, this privilege of being able to look to the horizon and see the rain coming. But it's the church in Jerusalem that is gloriously rained upon. So Joel saw it coming, but the church was blessed, showers of blessing, poured out on all flesh. A beautiful gift to the church at Pentecost, but not only for them, all flesh. On your sons and your daughters, on your male servants and female servants, on the young men, on the old men, God causes His Spirit to come down on all flesh, which is to say that God comes in His Spirit without respect to persons. That he is not constrained by pedigree or by age or by gender or by class. The gifting of the Spirit overcomes mankind's prejudices. It cuts across all social boundaries. It cuts straight through human lines of demarcation, divisions. Young, old, rich, poor, men, women, child, slave, free. This is... What the prophet Jeremiah predicted, they shall know me from the least to the greatest. God's perfect plan that people of all nations, of all ages, of all colors, of all status will be the beneficiaries of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And he will empower people everywhere to prophesy, to see visions, to dream dreams. Now, none of you who are familiar with the scripture would look probably at those last few manifestations and find in them anything remarkable. If you are familiar with the scripture, that's not remarkable because the Bible is full of stories of prophets and prophecy, right? And visions are also a way that God historically has made himself Known And then when we think of dreams, who do you think of? You probably think of Joseph and dreams that get him in trouble with his brothers or Daniel and his ability to interpret dreams. And, of course, there's, there's much more. So what has changed? What is different? What is so exciting or to be celebrated about God's pouring out his Holy Spirit? What is fulfilled and inaugurated at Pentecost is not how the Spirit of God works but the expansion of who the Spirit of God will be working through. Okay? It's not how he works. It's who he will be working through. Think about it. If the youngsters were already prophesying or seeing visions or having spiritual dreams, if the servants were already preaching, none of this would be noteworthy, right? Joel could have said, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh and nothing will change. That would be silly, but because that wasn't true. Everyone will carry on as they've always been carrying on. The Spirit isn't going to make any difference at all. No. The Holy Spirit changes everything. The Holy Spirit changes the trajectory of the church of Jesus Christ. All flesh. The indwelling Spirit will do His work in new ways that will break the old molds filling and empowering people across the spectrum of human existence and thus increasing the volume, the magnitude of the witnessing that's going to get done in this world. The Spirit is poured out on all flesh. And by the way, that includes you. The Spirit is poured out on you. Do you think yourself too ordinary for God's work? Think again. God loves to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's one of the ways that he gets the glory, right? 
If he can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things, and everybody knows how ordinary we are, and yet this extraordinary stuff is happening, who gets the glory? The Lord gets the glory. How did you do that? I didn't do that. How did you know that? I didn't know that. How did you say that? Did I say that? Do you think yourself unqualified for God's work? Think again. It is an old line, but it is a good line. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Right? We know all about that from our, from our study in Exodus and the, and the dispute that Moses had with God. And I'm not really good at this. I, I don't think I can speak. I'm not, and God has to call him up short. Mo, Moses, who makes mouths? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. It was you. Yes. If you think yourself unqualified for God's work, think again. He will qualify you and he will equip you for the work that he's calling you to do. Do you think yourself too broken for God's work? Do you think you have, as many do, reached a point of no return where I believe that God can save me and I believe that God can forgive me, but I believe that I'm just too flawed, just too broken, or there's just too much in my past that God cannot use. And so what I want to do is I want to limp out my last remaining years in this world quietly and unobtrusively, and I don't want to call attention to myself because I don't stand up under scrutiny, and I know it, and everybody knows it, so I'm just going to sort of limp to this finish line and hope nobody sees me. That is not the gospel. In Christ you are a new creation. The old is past. Behold, the new is come. You are not too broken to be used by God. If you think yourself too broken, think again. It is God's delight to use the broken things of this world. Right? We are. Corinthians tells us we're all cracked pots. We're all jars of clay. Everyone is fragile. Everyone has, has problems. Nobody is perfect. And yet it is God's good pleasure to put the treasure of the gospel in these clay pots. Amen? You are not too broken. You are not. Think again. He delights to use you. Friend, the Spirit rests on and fills all whom God chooses. And there is no reason to be an observer in this phenomenon when you could be a recipient of it. You got that? There's no reason to sit on the sidelines and look at that when you could be part of it. So don't resist the Lord. Stop turning your back on Him. Stop putting up the walls. Stop believing that I'll get to that later. You don't know what later holds. What if God has something for you right now? What if God wants something from you and for you right now? Now let's think for a minute of why God would put his spirit in in his people so that they would prophesy and see visions and dream dreams and so on. Why? To what end does is a spirit come? We saw it last week. Um, most dramatically, when the Galilean disciples spilled into the streets and they were speaking other languages, uh, dialects that weren't their own, but belonging to the multitude of visitors in the city from every nation under heaven, communicating the mighty works of God, they did this, Luke says, as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit empowers the people of God to communicate the truth of God, which is to say the gifts or the manifestations of the Spirit, in this case prophesying and seeing visions and dreaming dreams, all of which we will read more about as, uh, Lord willing, we make our way through this book of Acts. These gifts serve divine purposes, okay? That's what the Spirit does when he distributes gifts. He has a divine purpose in mind, his glory and the good of the church. The Spirit is not doing his work so anyone can take credit for it. Catch that because it's a temptation when God gifts you in something that you might 
slide into that sense that it's because of your goodness, your greatness, your intellect, your strength, your wisdom. But the Bible teaches us fairly plainly, right? It's not by power or might, but by what? By my spirit, says the Lord. So the spirit's not doing his work so anyone can take credit for it. And the spirit is not doing his work so anyone can have a religious experience for experience sake. The spirit poured out on all flesh is God's chosen means for equipping his people in the unstoppable work of advancing his kingdom, building his church throughout the world. In his commentary on Acts, Tony Morita writes, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a participant in the king's mission. He has empowered you by his spirit to tell of his glory for the world's benefit. The pouring out of the spirit enables all of us to be prophets for God. And that isn't to say that all of us will have the spiritual gift of prophecy, but like the prophets of old through the Spirit, we may know God and make Him known. That is what we are to do. And that's quite a change from the Old Testament way of God's Spirit drawn near to an individual here, to a prophet here, anointing a king here with these specific words and power to carry out God's will. No, this is way different. The Spirit will be poured out on all flesh to know God and to make him known. Believers everywhere will be able, again in the words of Tony Merida, to know God truly and make him known faithfully. And in that way, we should, uh, we should know this by now. In what way? In what way do we make him known? Well, we'll find out as we go to the rest of Peter's sermon next week. But let me, let me spoil it a little. We talked about it last week. And pretty much we talk about it every week. So you might guess the way to make God known and the intention of his spirit in us is to preach the gospel. It is to preach Christ. It is to be his witnesses. That's what the first disciples did on the day of Pentecost is the spirit gave them the ability to communicate in languages in which they were unlearned and unskilled. And the same spirit is more than willing and able to give us everything we need to overcome our weaknesses and our real or perceived inabilities to make the story of Jesus known. With our words, with our lives, make the story of Jesus known. And we might wonder, and some would, especially if we have been um, brought up in, in, in the thinking that my relationship with God is just a private and a personal thing, we might wonder, well, what, why do I need to do this? What is, what is God's end game? What does he want to have happen? Why do we make Jesus known? It's not, it's not just because God looked upon us and he said, well, you look bored. <laughs> Let me give you something to do. It's not just that, that idle hands are the devil's playground. They are, so. But that's not what it's about, is it? What it's about is this. Feel the weight of it, I hope. You and I are part of the king's mission to see that people get saved. We are part of the king's mission to see that people are saved. So as Joel looked into the future and he saw the pouring out of the Spirit on all flesh, he saw something else. And I will show wonders. He's continuing. Peter's quoting Joel still. And I will show wonders. Wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke and sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And if, if you read that like I do and you feel like, ah, I'm sinking in the deep wind of the pool now, so I'm not exactly sure what this looks like or how it plays out. Look, there's a lot of people floating around in the deep end of that pool. But listen, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There are Bible scholars who don't all agree on what these signs mean or when they will take place or if some of them have already taken place on some level. Okay, And that's fine because that's not the point of the passage the inescapable, indisputable, most urgent point to this passage is that the day of the Lord's judgment is coming. That's what Joel's getting across. Judgment is coming. 
Joel chapter 3, verse 2, God is speaking. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there. Jehoshaphat means Yahweh judges. Later on in the book of Joel, we call this a valley of decision. The Bible teaches that everyone's going to be judged by God. And on the one hand, that is not good news. Okay, We don't usually read that if we have any self-awareness at all to think that is good news. That we are going to stand before a holy God and give an account for ourselves. That is not great news because who could stand in that judgment? And the psalmist actually answers that for us, right? If thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, who could stand? The answer, of course, is no one. We would melt before a holy God. It's a terrifying thing to, to, to think that we would stand before the consuming fire of a holy God on our own merits. So that's not good news. But on the other hand, the Bible teaches that the judgment of God for sin has already been rendered and the penalty satisfied by Jesus when he died on the cross. In the stead of ruined sinners is how we sing about it, right? Our substitute taken our place. And that, my friend, is good news. And this is what we proclaim. That Jesus has paid for our sin with his perfect life and sacrifice. And if we trust him, we are saved from God's wrath. Because he bore God's wrath on the cross. Because the prophet Isaiah says, by his stripes we are healed. All who call upon the name of this Lord, both Joel and Peter say, will be saved. And as we will soon read in Acts 4.12, the name we call on is what? Jesus. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Friend, God's judgment is coming on all. And when that day of judgment comes, will you take your chances on your record, realizing that anything short of perfection warrants eternity in hell? Or will you take your place under the cross, under the blood of Jesus that was shed for the forgiveness of your sin? And will you, by faith, inherit everlasting life from the Lord. I'd like you to consider wherever you are in your faith journey, and particularly if you're seeking this morning, if you're here, um, if you're here wondering what this is all about or uh, you have some questions or thoughts or you're not even sure if you believe, I would like you to think about this just for a second, that so far all the prophecies Joel made have come true. And I want to ask you, if, especially if you don't have this relationship with Jesus, because there's a lot at stake, all the prophecies of Joel have come true. Is there any reason to believe that he would not be right about the day of the Lord? Not be right about the judgment that's coming, but also not be right about the way to be delivered from it. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So have you called upon the name of the Lord for your salvation? And if you have not, will you call upon the name of the Lord for your salvation? Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the gift of your word and for the way it ministers to our hearts as we continue to worship you in song, we pray that the power of your spirit would press into us the meaning of these words, the beauty of these melodies, and Lord, that we would experience you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.